finds himself in prison. Uh, he says, I'm in chains for the gospel. And uh, the Christians from Philippi, which is who this letter is named after, Philippians, uh, have sent him um, finances and resources to support him as he's in prison. And they've sent um, you know, some people along to um, encourage him. And he refers to them as partners in the gospel. And he says, we're all sharers of God's grace together. And um, Paul is, one of the main reasons he's writing this is to respond to that and to say uh, to the Christians there, you know, thank you. And he wants to encourage them and build them up. But um, you get a sense that um, even though he's in prison, um, there's, he's just filled with great joy at what at what is going on around him. And so um, we get that as we uh, go to Philippians 1, verse 12. It says this, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, sisters, (laughs) that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. This is what he's saying from prison. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, uh, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincere, uh, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. I mean, this is a man in prison. And Paul's task uh, in general is um, he was divinely called by God himself to take the gospel message, to take um, the message of Jesus throughout the Roman Empire. And, um, you know, the Roman Empire is ruled by a uh, self-appointed Lord and Saviour, Caesar, who's the emperor. And he would refer to himself that way, history records. But Paul was declaring this, there's a greater Lord and Saviour. There's one whose name is above all names. There's one more powerful than any rulers and authorities this earth can produce. And uh, when you go out with that sort of message, um, you can expect some opposition. Because he's saying, uh, let me tell you about the true Lord and Savior. Um, Especially when people start believing you. (laughs) Um, There's going to be opposition. And so we know that the early church grew really quickly. And this message that Jesus the worthy one, the the innocent one who has given his own life so that people no longer had to be held uh, to their past actions, so that people no longer had to be determined uh, by where they've been in their history. Um, He gave his life for all people, that by his name, all people can become right with God. That's the message of Jesus Christ which Paul has taken throughout the Roman Empire, and is, the message is starting to have significant impact. Uh, and that's, you know, when we look at early church history, the incredible impact that the church, the growing church, had on that empire. And so that's why Paul finds himself in prison, and he's calling on people to worship the true Lord and King, Jesus Christ. You know, the gospel has an impact. The gospel message... The message of Jesus, the message um, of Jesus transforms. It, it impacts things. It changes things. And may today it transform us as we uh, reflect on the message of Jesus Christ. May it transform us and change things for the better. But although Paul's in prison, he seems quite upbeat and joyful. Did you pick that up in the reading? Um, He writes these words to his Christian friends. He says, don't worry about what's happened to me. I'm going to reword it a little bit. Don't worry about what's happened to me. Don't be discouraged. It's serving the gospel. The entire palace guard is hearing about Jesus. Um, The Roman soldiers are talking about it and everyone knows it. 
And what's more, it's encouraged the church here, the brothers and sisters, to speak the word of God more courageously and fiercely, or fearlessly. So, you know, in light of this passage, I just want to share with you three characteristics of people who follow Jesus. And we see it in Paul uh, as he writes. But the first characteristic of someone who follows Jesus is that followers of Jesus find great joy in advancing the gospel. They find great joy in the message of Jesus Christ being shared, um, in making him known. When we read the letter and understand the story behind it, that a man is in prison and is rejoicing in his hardship. Uh, as, uh, sorry, rejoicing that his hardship has led to greater understanding of Jesus. Uh, we get a sense that the advancement of the gospel is his number one priority. No matter what's happening to him. Kathy, you might just want to close that door, if that's all right. Thank you. Um, here is a man who understands the freedom that Christ makes available. Not only to him, but to people everywhere. This is a man, Paul, who wrote in Galatians. He wrote, he's written quite a few letters uh, in the scriptures. He wrote in Galatians. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And in Ephesians he writes this, It is by grace that you have been saved. It's a gift from God. And in Romans he writes again, Therefore there is now no, listen to this, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's the writings of Paul. No wonder Paul is excited that the message is being advanced. Uh, we all share in this same grace. We share as a grace together. This same message of freedom, we share it together. You know, God calls us to share this message with our community. It's a message of forgiveness and freedom. It is a message that can change human hearts there's nothing more beautiful than seeing the message of God's unconditional forgiveness soak deep within someone's heart. Even into the darkest, uh, the hardest of hearts. And, and to start to melt and transform the person from the inside out. It is a beautiful thing to witness. And then that person becomes a bearer of the news. A witness to the life transforming message. You know, we should never forget or become complacent about what we're here to do. The church is an outward focused movement. Whether we are expect experiencing hard times or facing gospels or not, we are here to tell a dying and lost world that there is life and freedom to be had. And no matter what trials or obstacles come our way, we are to point people to Jesus in whom there is life and freedom. So the second characteristic of people who follow Jesus is that people who follow Jesus have eyes to see where God is at work in every situation, even when they face adversity and opposition. That's what we see in the witness of Paul here. When a situation looks like defeat, God can use it for a great victory. As followers of Jesus, we learn to see what God is doing in every situation. And if we think of that concept, we see that ultimately play out with Jesus on the cross. What looks like a defeat ends up being God's greatest victory. God has a way of doing that. And in Paul's situation, we see that Paul was sent on mission and is called by God to travel from town to town and spread the message of Jesus Christ. He didn't like to stay in one place too long because it was... God's plan and purpose that he should spread the gospel far and wide to plant churches all over the world and now he finds himself in prison because of his call facing possible death. You know, he could have fallen into self-pity. He could have been excused for seeing the situation as dire and, and useless. He could have been, become disillusioned. Because God's call didn't seem to be working out for him, but Paul had eyes to see where God was at work. Through unlikely circumstances, he's talking to the prison guards about his purpose, about his mission. 
And so now all the guards have heard the message of Jesus and it's having a ripple effect in the city. It's going out from the prison and it's firing up the local church. It's firing them up and encouraging them to be more courageous and fearless in their witness. And that is having an impact on the city. You know, God is always at work around us. He's always doing something. In our best times and in our worst times. And when we see God at work, we should take that as an invitation to get involved in what he's doing. God, give us eyes to see where you're at work. When we do it, when we respond to where God is at work, it will have a ripple effect that will encourage others and build others up and the message will go out. It's always a challenge for us to respond to difficulty by looking at where God is working around us. But that is the challenge for each of us. There may be some of you here who feel like God is not near, that God's not involved. Some of you may be experiencing hard times and wondering where God is. I want to encourage you to pray this prayer, Lord, give me eyes to see where you're at work. Give me eyes to see and see what he reveals. And then the last part of this scripture says this. This is from um, halfway through verse 18. It says, yes, I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to, to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. The third characteristic of um, followers of Jesus is that followers of Jesus have hope that is irrational. We have a hope that is irrational. I mean, he says, I'm expecting to be released, but I might die. Pray for me that whatever ends up happening to me, that I will honour Christ for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I know that when I die, I'll go to be with Jesus, which would be awesome. That's what he's saying. But if I live, I get to come and be with you and build you up. Either way, it's fine on me. Man, Paul's faith gives him hope that is irrational. It gives him hope beyond measure. In Hebrews 10, the word says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. The God who promises the hope we have. He is faithful. He is a man who is able to say, whether I live or die, I'm centred on Jesus Christ. I'm facing him all the way. My eyes are fixed. And that is a deep, deep faith to be able to say that. Followers of Jesus have hope in life and in death. You know, we have a hope of future glory when we will one day see God face to face in his full glory. But the thing about future glory that God promises is that it can be found here and now in Jesus Christ. It is found in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. The moment we turn to him, that moment we accept his amazing love and forgiveness, then we have a hope that is irrational. It doesn't stand up to the reasoning of this world. It is beyond that. 
And so in a moment, we're going to sing um, a song that's called uh, What a Beautiful Name It Is. It talks about the name of Jesus. Now, God wants to be known by all people. That's the exact reason he sent Jesus. In Jesus Christ, we see who God is. In Jesus Christ, we have a complete picture of the creator God, the one who sits above all. You know, God invites each of us to fellowship with him, and I invite you each to open yourselves up to God this morning, to allow his Holy Spirit to work in you and to bring revelation of his love. Uh, in Jesus, all of life falls into place. There's no other name by which people can be saved. Only Jesus. He is the beginning and the end. He holds all things together. His name is above all name. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he came for you and me to give us life. Um, if you're burdened this morning, then take the words of Matthew where Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let's uh, play this song and sing and uh, spend this time um, focused on the Lord Jesus. <laughs>